بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته وذ إمام الحجاوي في زاد المستقنع في اختصار المقنع We are now at باب زكاة الحبوب والثمار The chapter of zakah pertaining to grains and fruits pertaining to produce from the earth and fruits Some ulama, they gave a different title to the one which Hijari gave <coughs> They called it zakat kharij min al ard zakat al kharij min al ard zakat of that which emanates or which comes out from the ground does anybody know why some of the ulama gave it this title rather than the title that imam al hajjawi gave one of the reasons is because allah azawajal in surah al baqarah he says ya ayyuhal ladina amanu anfiqu min tayyibati ma kasabtum wa mimma akhrajna lakum min al ard o you who believe Spend of that which you have earned from the good things that you have gathered and earned, and from that which we have brought forth for you from the earth. So that which is brought forth from the earth, they took it from this zakat al kharij min al ard, zakat of that which is taken from the earth. In any case, our Imam, our author, he said, "Bab zakat al hubub wa thimar," and the first statement he makes in this place, he says, "Tajibu fil hubub kulliha." وَلَوْ لَمْ تَكُنْ قُوتًا It's obligatory in all of the grains that are taken from the earth, that are grown in the earth, even if they are not قُوت. وَلَوْ لَمْ تَكُنْ قُوتًا Even if they are not staple foods that are eaten for nourishment. So, Sheikh Al-Maqsoob, Masqoob, he says, بَيْنَ أَنْهَا تَجِبِ فِي كُلِّ حَبُوبِ كَشَعِيرِ وَالْحَمْطَ So the author, he explains that it's obligatory in all types of grains, like شَعِيرِ بَالِي and like hanta, okay, and like wheat. Well, bur, well, adis, and also lentils, lentils, wasair al hubub, and all other types of grains. Well, low lem takun kutan, even if it's not eaten as nourishment uh, in general in a land, okay. For example, he says, well, hab, kal habbatu sauda, like the uh, black seeds, or al fajl, or radish, or nahwihi, and things like that. For these things are not generally eaten as nourishment. They're not taken as meals. Like to zakka, but they are given zakka on them. Because verily, they are grains and seeds. So the condition is that zakka is obligatory on that, which are grains and seeds planted in the earth. Even if they are not um, staple foods. So we have a hadith collected by Imam Bukhari where he reports from Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu marfu'an that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said fi ma saqat al-samā'u wal-'ayūn that which is watered by the heavens meaning the rain and the streams al-'ayūn aw kana athariyan aw kana athariyan athariyan is those plants or those vegetation which grow around swamps and they like al-'ushr so that which is watered by the plants or the streams and rivers etc an urs of one tenth is due in them of zakah. And that which is watered from the vegetation uh, by human intervention, then niswal urshul, then half of that, half of the one tenth is due. Okay, so where is the wajhul dalala in this hadith that uh, in all of the hubub, in all of the grains, zakah is obligatory? In all of the grains, where the author said, Tajibu fil hubub kulliha, that in all of the grains, uh, zakah is obligatory. Where is the evidence from the hadith that I just mentioned to you? Exactly. So this is am. This is um, general for everything which is grown on the earth. Okay? This is a general statement of the Prophet ﷺ for everything which is grown on the earth. Very good. The author, he then says, وَفِي كُلِّ ثَمَرٍ يُكَالُ وَيُدَّخَرُ And also in every fruit which is uh, measured, okay, and which is stored. So two conditions here. Every fruit which is measured and stored, okay. Um, measured, it means like in the time of the Prophet ﷺ, there were different measurements of volume, like a saw, for example, okay. And with regards to yudakhar, stored, uh, the shirt, Mansur al saqib he explains, he says, He said, the meaning of storage here means that the people in general, 
in the times of the Prophet وسلم, they would store this type of food. Okay, Mithaluhu, an example of that is tamar, dates. For very dates, they are measured in volume and they are stored. Even if they are eaten, right. The point is that these types of fruits, they are stored and they are measured in volume. And likewise, it's like, as an example, is grapes. As for those fruits which are not measured, okay, uh, in a quantity of measurement, as it was in the time of the Prophet ﷺ in Medina, and nor are they stored by the people, then these fruits, there is no zakat upon them. So an example is, um, the example that the Sheikh gave here, is that of apples. So there's no zakat in apples because it's not measured in volume, nor is it stored, okay? So the two conditions, al-kayl, uh, measurement of volume, well, iddikhar, and storing must be there. And the storing is that which was stored by common folk, not people who use huge refrigerators or any of that type to store stuff. It means like how the common farmers and the common people would store their food, okay? And as we said, a cave is a measurement of volume that was used in the time of the people of Medina, uh, like a sa'a, like a mud, and like a wasp, okay? These kind of measurements, which are measurements of volume. Uh, so there would be like a container, and that container is filled to a certain level, and they will say that this is a sa'a, or this is a mud, and this is a wasp. The author, he says, katamarin was a zabib. Likewise, uh, as an example, the author, he gave like dates and zabib and raisins. So dates and raisins are measured, okay, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and uh, in Medina, and they were also stored. So this kind of things, zakat is upon them. So if it's like apples, which are not measured, sold in measurement, okay, rather they are sold in weight, and they're not uh, stored, um, then these things uh, would not, and bananas also, for example, would not have zakat upon them. The point to mention, as I've just touched upon, is that uh, it's not what is weighed today, it's what was weighed in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu And it's not what is measured today in measurements of sa'a, etc. Is what was done in the time of Medina, in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is what we refer to for what zakat is upon or not. The author, he said, And with regards to the grains and the fruits, which are measured and which are stored, okay, uh, you have to, before giving zakat upon them, you have to, of course, consider that they should be on nisab. Okay, the nisab, as we know, is the amount that it has to reach before uh, zakat becomes obligatory upon that wealth. And in this situation, talking about the grains and the fruits. So the author, he tells us what is the nisab. He says, He says that its amount, the nisab of the grains and the fruits, are 1,600 ratlin Iraqi. So this measurement, Iraqi ratl, 1,600 of them, okay, is what is the measurement. But what does that mean for us in today's time? So the ulama, they said that this measurement is around 300 sa'a nabawi. It's 300 sa'a of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam in the time of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, which equates to around 675 kilograms. So if somebody owns, okay, uh, habub grains and it's like of 675 grams, kilograms or more, or fruit, which is stored and measured of 675 kilograms or more, thereupon they would have to give zakah on those items. The author, he said, The author is now telling us that at times, the harvest in a year is twice, okay? And the first harvest may not have reached the nisab. So the second harvest, when it's combined with the first harvest, then altogether it will be the nisab and above. So this is what is done, that the, the, uh, the, veget the what is grown on the earth and the fruits, as we said, those which are stored and those which are measured, they are to be, the two harvests are to be brought together if need be, so that they can be above the nisab. So as an example, in the first harvest, it may be that 400 kilograms of a particular fruit was gathered. And in the second harvest of the year, 
then another 400 kilograms was gathered, okay? And so to be above 675 kilograms, both of them would be joined, both of the two harvests of the one year would be joined, and then zakah would be paid upon them. So what he says, la jinsun ila akhar. However, if the species of the, uh, the hab and the uh, thimar and the fruits are different, then in this situation, the harvest, they cannot be joined. For example, if you have a harvest of dates, which is below the nisab, and then you have a harvest of figs, which is below the nisab, you cannot join the two to create a nisab and to give zakat upon them. Why? Because they are of different jinns, they are of different species. However, if it's one jinns that has different types, for example, you have dates, we know that dates, they come in a variety of different types. You have the sukri dates, you have the khalas dates, and so many other, right? So the one species that has different types underneath them, like dates, they can all be joined to create the nisab if needed be, as, men as mentioned by Sheikh Alam al bahjat in his explanation. The author, he said, وَيُؤْتَبَرُوا أَنْ يَكُونُ nisab مَمْلُوكًا لَهُ وَقْتُهُ And it's a consideration the zakah, so it's in consideration that the nisab has to be owned by the person at the time when zakah is obligatory. So the nisab of the fruit and the grains has to be owned in ownership of the person at the, at the time when the zakah is obligatory. So zakah upon the fruits, of course, is when they ripen, when many of the fruits, they turn yellow or red, and upon the grains, when they harden, right? When the wheat becomes hard and the shell of the wheat becomes hard, uh, this is the time when the zakah is obligatory. So what do we understand from this? If a person uh, has the nisab, okay, of grain and fruit, however, he sells his land before they ripen and before the grains become hard. So in this situation, the seller won't be the one who's responsible to pay zakah, rather it is the one who purchased the land whereupon the fruits and the vegetation are, the fruits and the grains are, sorry, and that person will have to pay the zakah. Because, because the person who sells the land before the time of the fruit ripening and before the time of the harvest of the wheat, etc., becoming hard, the grains becoming hard, then it means that he sold the land before wajub as zakah, before the time zakah was obligatory. So the nisab has to be in the person's possession at the time when the zakah becomes obligatory, which is when the fruits ripen and when the grains become hardened, etc. The author, he says, فَلَا تَجِبُوا فِي مَا يَكْتَسِبُهُ اللقات. And there is no zakah on the amount of grain or the amount of fruits that the luqat gather. The luqat are those people who go through the farm after the harvest has taken place. And they pick up from the ground whatever is left off, whatever is left over from the harvest. So these people, they're picking up the fruits and whatever is left from the grains. They may reach the level of nisab, but upon them there is no zakah. Why is there no zakah upon them? Um, because um, they don't have ownership. And barakallah it's half the answer. They didn't have ownership at the time of when the fruit was ripened or when the uh, when the when the had became hardened when the wheat etc became hardened so rather they picked up the fruit and the uh, the seeds etc the wheat etc after the harvest had taken place so they didn't have ownership at the time when zakah was uh, virgin which was at the time of the ripening and at the time of the uh, the wheat etc becoming hard the author he says if a person uh, takes these fruits and these grains by doing hasad, okay, then there's no zakat upon him. So the ulama that explained this, they say, for example, a person, he enters into a contract with the owner of the land, and he says that I will harvest your land. However, when I harvest your land, I'm going to take a quarter of the produce. So he enters into a contract and he harvests the land for the owner, and he takes a quarter of the produce. Here also, there's no zakat upon what this person has gathered. And the illa, the reason is that the ulama, they say, Like the previous illa we gave, that this person, he wasn't in ownership of these 
of this produce at the time of wujub zakah, at the time when uh, zakah was wajib, rather he became an owner after that, which was after they had become ripe. Okay, so he he was an owner of that produce thereafter, after the harvest, basically, or at the time of harvest. So he says, and also there is no zakah on a person that gathers grains or fruits from land which is mubah. Land which is mubah, it means that land which is not owned by any particular individual, company, or any organization, or any of that nature, open pastures. So open pastures like forests, example. So uh, Sheikh uh, Ahmed, um, Sheikh Ahmed Bahjad, he says, for example, so a person goes to a forest and he finds in there fruits and grains growing plentiful uh, upon which zakat is due. So he gathers these and there's no zakat upon him, even though they are ripe and hardened. Why? Because this is open land, land which is not owned by anybody. Okay, it was grown without anybody's intervention. It was just grown there by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's blessings. So this person gathered that stuff and there's no zakat upon him unless he sells it as a rudu tijara. If he sells that stuff as trade products, then of course he would pray, he would pay the zakat of trade products, but not the zakat of that which comes from the earth. The author he gives examples of that which is grown in these lands which are mubah, and he says kal bottom. Bottom is uh, something which is a pistachio plant and uh, for cashews. And he says, well, and Zabal is Sha'ir al Jabal, wheat which is grown in the mountains. And he said, well, Bizri Qatuna. Bizri Qatuna, I have no idea what it is. And in fact, even Sheikh Ahmed Bahjad, he told his students when he was explaining, you guys go away and do your research on what this means. <laughs> the author, he said, even if these type of plants, they grew in his earth. In, in the land which he owned, okay? Even if they grew in the land which he owned, there's no zakat upon them because there was no human intervention. The owner of the land, he didn't plant those things. Rather, they came about through, through Allah's blessings, through Allah's permission. There was no human intervention, so they grew naturally. Therefore, there's no zakat upon them. The author, he said, well, low. He used the word low. And if you remember in the previous classes, I mentioned what is the meaning of the word low when many a time the fuqaha use it. What is the meaning of the word low? When many a time the they use this word. So we said low, that the ulama, when they use it, it means that it shows that there is a difference of opinion. So he said, when, when using low, it shows that there's a difference of opinion in the mas'ala, a difference of opinion which is weighty, and that's why they use the word low to show that they are differing with that opinion which is a weighty opinion. The author, he says, Faslun, section. The, the author, he says, after the mentioning section, he says that what's obligatory is the ushr, one-tenth, fima suqya bila mu'natin. A tenth is obligatory in that which is watered without human intervention, by the watering of the rain, by the watering of the streams, etc. And as uh, Sheikh uh, Mansoor mentioned, he said, even if it meant that the person digs irrigation uh, from the from the uh, plantation up until the stream so that that water can be fed to the uh, plantation even then it's an ushr okay it's one tenth we'll come to know that when this human intervention the zakah rate differs here we're talking about that which is watered by allah subhanahu wa ta'ala through the rains and through the streams okay that which is watered without any human intervention, okay, like the rain and the streams. So why is it the case that, as Sheikh Mansour mentioned, that when you dig the pathways to the stream, so there is human intervention here, but still it's considered to be under this category of no human intervention. Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman, in his explanation, he's the one who posed this question and this mas'ala, he said that it's because this, um, this plowing, this, this digging of the irrigation, the stream is like plowing the land, which is a must. It's, it's part and parcel of growing uh, crops, etc. It's something which has to take place. And also it's not something which takes place more than once likely 
uh, in a year. So it's something which is not given consideration to. So even if you irrigate the land, okay, by digging a, a, a way to the uh, stream, then this is still not considered uh, This is not considered human intervention. Dorothy says, And if it be that this human intervention, for example, the person he buys uh, camels to operate water wheels, or he buys water sprays, and he brings water to the uh, plantation, then in this situation, he has to pay a 20th, not one tenth, but rather he has to pay a 20th of the produce. So it's less than what it is if it's naturally watered. If he has, to, if the owner of the land makes effort, then from the wisdom of the Sharia and the justice of the Sharia, that the zakah rate is less. less. In this case, it's nisful al which is a 20th of the produce. Because based on the hadith that we took previously of Ibn Umar radiallahu anhu, where the Prophet sallallahu said, as collected by Imam Bukhari, Fima in that which is watered by the rain and the Uyun, the streams, etc., or Kana Atharian, or that which grows around the uh, swamps, etc., Al Ushr, then one tenth is given. And that which is um, watered by human intervention, okay, is given Nisful Ushr, half of one tenth, which is a twentieth. The author, he says, And if it's the case that at times, okay, uh, it's the produce is watered by human intervention, like in, for example, in the summer, uh, when there's hardly any rain, and then there's times like in the winter, when it's watered by, uh, without any effort from the human, then in this situation, three quarters of a tenth is going to be given. So, ثَلَاتَةُ أَرْبَائِهِ بِهِمَا Meaning that when both situations take place at different times, that it's naturally watered or it's watered by human intervention at different times of the year, then in this situation, three quarters of a tenth is to be paid in zakat. The author he says, فَإِن تَفَاوَتَا فَبِأَكْثَرِهِمَا نَفْعًا And if it be the case that it's not clear, okay, it's, there's not a clear distinction of uh, how much amount of time was watered by the rains, for example, and how much amount of time was watered by the intervention of the sprays, then in this situation, you would look to which system of watering, the natural system or the system of using the sprays, etc., was more beneficial for the plantation. Okay? So if you find out that the water which was given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to the rains was more beneficial, then you would give a tenth. If you find that it was the manual water which was given to be more beneficial, then you'd give a twentieth, okay, of the of the produce in zakat. So this is in a situation where there's not a clear distinction of um, of, of of what water was given uh, most of the time of the year, okay. So then you would look to which one was more beneficial in 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 its operation. He says, and if it be the situation that you cannot determine which one was more beneficial, then you would give al ushr You would go back to the asr and you would give al ushr Why would you go back to the asr in this situation? If you were, if there was no knowledge of which one was more beneficial, which watering system was more beneficial, the author says, the author says, you pay an ushr which means that you go back to the asr You go back to the original situation to pay a tenth. Why would you pay a tenth? Has mentioned it because the tenth is the asr. The tenth is the uh, original ruling, right? So you have to pay a tenth on crops which are watered by the heavens. And the only reason you pay half a tenth, one twentieth, is when there's human intervention. So if it be the case that we don't know, uh, you know, we can't determine the human intervention from the natural uh, watering, then in this situation we go back to the asr because this is known as abra al-dhimma. This is known as better in discharging responsibility because it's the asr and it's ahwat, it's, it's safer. The Shaykh, may Allah have mercy upon him, the author, he says, If the, as we mentioned in passing, that if the, uh, the grains, they become hard and the fruits, okay, that the fruits, they become ripened, then at this point, you have to give the zakah. Then the zakah becomes obligatory upon the person. 
uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-An'am, وَآتُوا حَقَّهُ يَوْمَ حَصَادِهِ And give its right, meaning give the zakat of the harvest, of the plantation, the day when you give its harvest. So we find here in this sentence of the author and the ayah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as well, that there is no hawl. There's no hawl when it comes to giving zakat on produce. You don't have to wait a year, obviously. The time when the zakat becomes obligatory and uh, is, is given consideration is the time when the fruits, they become ripened, ready to harvest, and the grains, they become hardened, ready, ready to ha harvest. So the author, the uh, Sheikh Mansur, he says, when Yambani, and built upon this mas'ala, which the author just mentioned, is a few things. So if a person sells his plantation, okay, of uh, date palm trees, for example, after they become ripe, so zakah is obligatory upon him. And of course, if he sells before they become ripe, the land with the plantation on it, then there's no zakah upon him. As long as he didn't intend to escape, in lam yaqsid al firar min zakah. As long as he didn't intend to escape paying the zakah by selling that land. And also, he gives another thing which is built upon this masala. He says, "Law mat malik fa in kana qabla wujub fala zakah alayhi." So, if a person, the owner, dies, then if it's before the fruits have become ripe and before the uh, the grains have become hardened, then there's no zakah upon him. Wa in kana baad wujub fa fihi. But if it was after they have become ripe and hardened, the person passed away, then the waratha, the inheritors, they would take a portion of the money and use that to give in zakah for what was due. The author, he says, And the wujub of the zakah of these grains and fruits, they are not fully obligatory upon the person. Not becoming fully, completely obligatory in his responsibility in his dhimma until they are put on the bather. A bather is a place that the um, people of produce know. It's a place where they put their fruits and they put their grains to dry out and to take off the leaves. Example, for example, from certain uh, grains and certain fruits. So it's a place where they leave it out to become dry and they leave it out to be for the fruit to to dry out from moisture, etc. So this is the once the zakah is put upon this place, then the uh, then the produce the zakah on it becomes fully obligatory. So based upon this, what the author has mentioned that if the grains and the fruit were put on uh, were destroyed before they were put on the bather, even though they became ripe. And they were hardened. If they were destroyed before they were put on the bather, then there is no zakah upon the person. There is no zakah upon the owner. And the author will give a, a bit more information on this. And uh, Sheikh Mansour he said the illa, the illa, the reason for this, ذلك في حكم من تثبت اليد عليه. It's like uh, it's given the hukm of the person not fully being able to grasp uh, the material upon which zakah is obligatory upon in this situation. So um, just to repeat that point, because I don't think it was clear, uh, the zakat is not fully obligatory upon the grains and the uh, fruit which is ripened until they are laid out on the bather. So when they are laid out on the place uh, used for drying out the wheat and drying out the fruits, etc., then the zakat becomes fully obligatory upon the owner. So if they happen to be destroyed by natural causes before that, then there's no zakat, there's no blame, there's no zakat upon the owner. The author, he says, And this is what the author explains. He said, if the grains and the fruits, they were destroyed before they were put on the bather, before they were put on the drying area, okay, without any ta'addin from the owner, then there's no zakah, saqatat, then there's no zakah obligatory upon him. So if the crops are ruined due to the owner's fault, if there's ta'addi or tafrit, I'll mention what these two mean. If there's ta'addi or tafrit from the owner, okay, then he still has to pay the zakah. But if it's not due to his fault, it was a natural cause, <laughs> then there's no zakah sought from him. So an example of tafrit, the word tafrit, لَوْ أَنَّهُ رَأَى بُدُوا الصَّلَاةِ لَكِنْ تَرَكَهُ وَأَهْمَلَهُ 
حتى جاءت صيون فافسدته فهو مفرط. So this tafrit, the word mufarrat means carelessness. Okay? So if this person, he had the produce and the dates on the date palm tree were now ripe and ready to be harvested. But he left it and he was careless in the regards of harvesting. Okay? So at this point, um, floods came and they destroyed the produce. So in this situation, the person, he has to pay the zakah. Because why? Because he was mufarrat, he was careless. And also, an example of ta'addi, an example of ta'addi, لو أن أنه أشعل النار تحت الثمار فتلفت فهذا متعدل. For example, the person, in, again, with the date palm trees, he, for whatever reason, made a fire under the date palm trees and the trees, they caught fire. This is an example of ta'addi. So in this situation, even though in both situations which I mentioned, they were not put on the bather to dry out and they were spoiled, but they were spoiled due to negligence or due to ta'addi, due to wrongful behavior from the owner. If they were spoiled before they were put on the bather, the drying out area, due to natural causes, then there's no zakah upon the owner. The author, he says, And the mustajid, the one who rents the earth, the earth, the, the, the farm, for example, he is the one that has to pay an ushur. If there's a situation where there's a rental contract between a person and the one who owns the farm where the produce is, is being grown, then the one who is renting the farm in order to grow that produce, he is the one, obviously, that has to pay the zakah and not the one who uh, owns the land. And the, the Sheikh Mansour, he explains, he says, because the zakah is a haq, is a right pertaining to the uh, produce, not a right pertaining to the land. So it's the one who owns the produce, not the one that owns the land. And an example to make this even more clear, he says, for example, if a person uh, rents a shop, so the one that is going to give the zakah is the one that is uh, making money from selling the produce, from selling the goods, and the one that owns the goods. So this is another example of explaining what the author meant. The author, he said, And if it's taken from the person's land, if a person has on his land, or it's taken from the mountain tops uh, that nobody owns, for example, من العسل, honey, if honey is taken from the person's land, or it's taken from open lands like on mountain tops, an amount of 160 ratlan Iraqi, 160 ratl Iraqi, which amounts to around 62 kilos of honey, then this person, then this person will have to pay a tenth of this honey. So a person likes to uh, develop honey for, as a hobby, or he likes to collect honey from the mountains for himself and his family and his friends. Once it reaches above 62 kilograms, okay, then a tenth of that honey has to be given in zakat. So we have the hadith collected by Imam Ibn Majah and authenticated by Shaykh al-Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, Abdullah ibn Amr radiallahu anhu, he said about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, annahu akhada min al-asl al-ushr, that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took from honey, al-ushr, one tenth from honey. Therefore, if a person has in his possession honey which amounts to more than 62 kilograms, then the person has to pay a tenth in zakah based upon this opinion. The author says, وَالْرِكَازُ مَا وُجْدَ مِنْ دَفْنِ الْجَاهِلِيَّةِ After having spoken about the fruits and the um, the hab and that which is grown from seeds, grains, etc. Then the author now mentions another type of produce, another type of uh, things which come from the earth uh, upon which zakah is obligatory. And this differs from the previous types. It is a rikaz, and that is my wujdam in dafni jahiliya. Rikaz basically is treasure which is found and it was belonging to the pre Islamic times. Okay, treasure which is found and it belonged to the kuffar of pre-Islam. This is a rikaz. So um, they mentioned the ulama. They mentioned and this is not restricted only to gold and silver. 
but rather also any type of valuable metals like iron and almas, diamonds, and other than that, which has a value. So any type of value um, material which is found in the ground, like uh, gold, silver, diamonds, iron, etc., then this has to have zakat upon it, and it's given the zakat of arikaz. Arikaz. فَفِيهِ الْخُمُسْ فِي قَلِيلِهِ وَكَثِيرِهِ And what you would give, you will give a khumus. You will give a fifth of whatever amount you find. So whatever amount of diamonds you find in the ground, whether it's a tiny amount, whether it's a huge amount, a fifth of it is going to be given. Sheikh Mansour, he mentions that there's four points that need to be considered here. He says, as a kaatu fi rikaz arba'atu umur. He said there's four matters which need to be remembered and considered in the zakat here. He said the first of them, anahu la nisab fihi, that there's no nisab. As we just mentioned, that it, whether it's a large amount or a small amount, zakat is given in it. Okay? Kathir or kathir. Wala yalzimu annahu yusallimu al sultan. And also, whatever is found in the ground from this treasure of jahiliya, pre Islamic treasures, it doesn't have to be given to the authority. Rather, the person can take responsibility upon himself to pay the, the fifth, okay, which is uh, due. It doesn't have to be given to the uh, the, uh, the government for them to do this. Rather, the person himself uh, can pay the fifth from what, it, what was found. The second point, that what is going to be paid is a khumas, is a fifth. As opposed to the rest of the types of zakat. Because in Bukhari, in the hadith, the Prophet said, in rikaz, in the pre Islamic treasures which are found, there is a khumas, there is a fifth. وَمَا بَقِيَ فَإِنَّهُ يَأْخُذُهُ وَاجِدُهُ And that which is left, the four, four of the fifths, which is left after paying the fifth, then the person who found this, he is the one that will keep that. The third matter, and the rikaz, لَيْسَ فِي اشْتِرَاقُ الْحَوْلِ The rikaz, there's no اشتراق, there's no condition of a hawl. There's no condition that a year has to pass upon it before it becomes obligatory. بَلْ مَتَرَ مَا وَجِدَهُ فَإِنَّهُ يَخْرُجْ سَكَاتُهُ Rather, whenever it's found, then zakat from it is paid. And fourth, يَجِبُ الْخُمَسْ عَلَى مَنْ وَجِدَ الْرِكَاسِ That the khumas is upon the one who found it, whether he is a Muslim, whether he is a non-Muslim like a dhimmi, whether he is a free man or a, or a slave. Okay? Whoever finds it, old, young, whatever the person's situation is, Muslim or non-Muslim, this person still has to pay a fifth of, of the, um, of the rikaz. Okay? Who is it paid to? The rikaz. It's not paid to the eight categories that zakat is paid to. The eight categories, categories which are found in Surah Tawbah, which we'll explain in, in another session. It's not paid to these, okay, to the miskin or the fuqara or the, or the wayfarer, uh, people like this. It's not paid to them. Rather, it's paid to the maslah uh, al ana It's paid to the general benefit for the Muslim uh, community, the Muslim ummah, like building roads, like building the surgery, etc. The author, he moves on to another uh, chapter, and he says, Bab zakat al -naqdain. He says, Bab zakat al -naqdain. Naqdain is referring to gold and silver. So, zakat pertaining to gold and silver. So, if zahab, if gold reaches the amount of ishreen mithqal, ishreen 20 mithqal is 20 Islamic dinars, okay? And 20 Islamic dinars. Okay, if you have 20 Islamic dinars in your possession uh, or more, then you have to pay zakat on that. Why? Because in the hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu, which is hadith marfu, collected by Imam Abi Dawood, the Prophet said, There's nothing upon you in terms of zakat in gold. Until you have 20 dinar, 20 Islamic gold coins. So if you have 20 dinar, and then a year passes upon them, then you have to give half a dinar. So the, the 20 dinar is the amount of the 20 dinar or the 20 mithqal in today's time is around roughly close to 85 gram dhahab, is around 85 grams of gold. So once a person has 85 grams of gold or more, then he has to pay zakat on that gold. Okay? He has to pay zakat 2.5% on that gold. The author, he said, And uh, 
in fibra, in silver, if you have 200 dirham, 200 silver coins, then you would pay a quarter of a tenth, which is 2.5% uh, from it. So 200 silver coins works out in today's terms to very close to 595 grams. A person has 595 grams, that becomes the nisab of silver, 85 for the gold and 595 grams for the silver. The author, he says, that you would join the gold to the silver in order to complete the nisab. Okay, if a person didn't have enough nisab, then you would join both of these commodities. For example, Sheikh Sami ibn Abd he gives an example. He says, A person has half of the nisab of silver, which is 100 silver coins. And he has, in terms of value of gold, that which equates another 100 silver coins. So in essence, he has 100 physical silver coins. And from the gold, he has that which equates 100 silver coins in, in monetary value. So in essence, he has reached the Nisab, and then he would pay the zakah based upon this, based upon joining these two commodities. Why is the person allowed to join the two, com two commodities? Question to yourselves. Why is the person allowed to join between gold and silver to reach the Nisab? Why is the person allowed to join the commodities? Because the maqsood, the objective of the two commodities is one. For both of them, the intent from them is that they're used for buying and selling. And both of them have value, which they are used for buying and selling. And the zakah, which is owed upon both silver and gold, is agreed upon, is the same, which is 2.5%. Okay, which is a quarter of a tenth. مسألة. Sheikh Sami ibn Abd Ahman, he mentions a masala. He says, هل يصح إخراج زكاة الذهب من الفضة وزكاة الفضة من الذهب? He said, is it permissible for you to pay your zakah, which is due on silver, by paying it through gold? And is it permissible for you to pay your zakah, which is due on gold, by paying it through silver? Okay, so he says, ذلك يجزي وأختاره ابن قدامة في المغرب. He said, that is permissible, Sheikh Sami ibn Abd Ahman. He said it's permissible, and it is what Ibn Qudam al-Maqtasi, in al-Mughni, volume 4, page 218, said is permissible. لِأَنَّ الْمَقْصُودُ مِنْ أَحَدِهِمَا يَحْسُ بِإِخْرَادِ الْآخِرِ Because the objective from one of them is achieved by giving zakah from the other. Because both of them, they have the same objective, which is for buying and selling and uh, having a value. طيب, the author, he says, وَتُدَمُّ قِيمَةُ الْعُرُودِ إِلَى كُلِّ مِنْهَا and a situation could be where a person needs to his stock, his aruda tijara, his trade stock, whatever that be, he needs to join that with his uh, gold and silver. Surah al Mas'ala. Surah al Mas'ala, uh, comprehending this Mas'ala, is as follows So a person has gold or silver equating to half of the Nisab. And he has trade goods. Equating to half the nisab, which is required. So in this situation, the trade goods would be joined with the gold and silver to make the nisab. What is the illa? What is the reasoning? Because the zakah and trade stocks, what is meant there is this value, not the trade, it's not the stock itself, but the value of the stock, right? And it is valued through gold or silver. So the, the gold and the silver and the trade stock in terms of its value is considered as one jins, as one commodity, we can say. This is the explanation that the ulama they give. The author says, It's permitted for a dhakr, okay, for the male, to have a silver ring. Sheikh Amir Bahjad, he said, why is it that the author he mentioned here, Yubahu Lidhlaqa, that is permitted for a male, and he didn't say it's permitted for a man. Why is it permitted for a male? He mentioned permitted for a male, but the author didn't say 
the word arajul. The reason here is that there is a difference between these two matters. Because when you say dhakar, male, it comprises whether the male is an adult or the male is a child. And this is why in the madhab, it's not permissible or it's haram to make the child wear what is a haram for the man to wear. So whatever is haram for the man to wear, is also haram for the child to wear as long as he's male. So again, the author, he said, It's permissible for a, man, for a male to wear a silver ring. Okay. Shirat Amir Bahjat, he says, Al Asmu fi lubs and fiddha fi haq rijal and manah. He said that the, uh, the asl, the foundation principle with regards to wearing silver for men is a manah, is a prohibition. Illa anna hustafna ahwalun, except that there are some situations which the evidence permit uh, as exceptions. Okay. And the first of them is that which we are taking is that you can wear a silver ring. And this is in the hadith. In Bukhari Muslim of Ibn Umar, the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Khatim al Fidda, the Takhadan Nas, Khawatim al Fidda. That the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he took a silver ring. So the people, they followed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in that, and they all took silver rings. So silver in a ring is permitted for a male. The second thing which is permitted, wa Qabi'a to Saif. Qabi'a to Saif is the, the handle of the sword. It's permitted, permitted to use this. Uh, to have this made of silver, okay? The evidence is in the hadith of uh, Ahmed, collected by Imam Ahmed and Abi Dawood, where Anas radiallahu anhu said, كانت قبيئة صيف رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم من فضة that verily the handle or the grasping point of the sword of the Prophet صلى الله عليه وسلم was made from silver. والعلة, and also the علة, a reason given, that verily it is a type of adornment which is commonly accepted for men. For very it is like a ring which is worn for men. So the handle of the sword, if it's decorated with silver or made from silver, then that is considered to be adornment which is permissible for a man to have. The author he says, uh, and also the Hilyatul Mintaqati. Hilyatul Mintaqati is like uh, a belt is worn, and this is mentioned by Sheikh Muhammad uh, Muqtar al Shirkiti in his explanation, that a belt is worn and it has around the middle a type of buckle of some sort which um, tightens the belt. And also swords that used to be put in this, in this area, in this type of buckle, belt buckle. Okay, so this is what is known by Hilyatul Mintaqati. Hilyatul Mintaqati. Uh, like a belt buckle where swords are, are, are put through uh, to be hung uh, for men, this is also permissible to be made from silver. And likewise, that which is made uh, from silver, likewise, وَنَحْوِهِ meaning other types of decoration for the sword or decoration for the armor which is used in warfare, uh, it can also have silver parts on it. So these are the exceptions that the author has given. Right? Sheikh Sami ibn Abdurrahman, he mentions an opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah saying that rather rather there's no restriction on the wearing of silver for, for the male okay as long as it doesn't lead towards israf as long as it doesn't lead towards the waste of money or to a tashabbuh tashabbuh uh, is um, Imitating like the kuffar or evil people, okay? As long as it doesn't lead to the resembling of evil people and it doesn't lead to the waste of money, then Ibn Taymiyyah said that you can wear uh, fiddah as you wish, okay? And from the evidences mentioned uh, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala abaha lana ma fil ardi jami'an that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has permitted everything for us which is found in or on the earth because Allah says in the Quran هو الذي خلق لكم ما في الأرض جميعا in Surah Al-Baqarah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for you everything which is found on the earth. Okay? وَأَنَّهُ لَا دَلِيلٌ صَحِيحٌ صَرِيحٌ يَدُلُّ عَلَى تَحْرِيمٍ لُبْسُ الْفِدَّةِ مُطْلَقًا وَعَلَى ذَلِكَ النَّبْقَى عَلَى الْأَصْلِ وَهُوَ الْإِبَاحَةِ And also that there is no uh, clear, apparent evidence to prohibit the wearing of silver. Okay? 
So we keep it upon the asal, which is that it fits under the ayah, which I just mentioned that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created for you everything in the earth to be used as you wish. And also a third point he mentioned, and we iterate in the point that there's no evidence to be found in the Quran or the Sunnah which prohibits silver like there is evidence to be found which prohibits gold. So we keep it upon the asr, okay, which is that it is permitted. So the uh, evidence that the um, opinion of Ibn Taymiyyah, ta one of the mustahid imams in the madhab is that it's permissible in uh, most cases, in all cases, as long as it doesn't lead to israf and uh, to a tashabbuh. The author he said, And from silver, what is allowed? Okay. Well, sorry, not from silver. We finish silver. From gold, what is allowed is also, is the handle of the sword. Okay. So the asl to the rijal and the muharram mutlaqan. The asl, the the foundation principle in gold is that it's all forbidden for man. Okay, that it's all forbidden for man. And if you remember the hadith, uh, the evidences we took previously in Kitab Tahara, for example, the hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu, collected by Ahmad and Abi Dawood, where the Prophet sallallahu alaihi fi yaminihi, that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he took silk and he put it in his right hand, and he took gold and he put it in his left hand. And he said that these two things are impermissible upon the men folk of my ummah, upon the male of my ummah. Okay? But as the ulama say, But there are exceptions to this asal, the first of them being the qabi'ah to safe. There are exceptions to this asal, like the qabi'ah to safe, and the evidences for this are atharan. From the evidences are two athar, two narrations from the companions. From the actions of the companions. The first of them, Imam Ahmed, he collects in Fabah al Sahaba. He collects in the book The Virtues of the Sahaba, uh, volume 1, page 256. Ibn Umar, Ibn Umar, he narrates that uh, his father, Umar, anhuma, the sword that he used to fight in Badr, it had plates of gold on it. Okay, it had plates, plating of gold on it. So this is an evidence that gold can be used in the sword. And also, Imam Ibn Abi Shayba, in his Musannaf, he collects from Uthman Ibn Hakim, قَالْ رَأَيْتُ فِي قَائِمِ صَيْفِ سَهَلْ Ibn حُنَيْفِ مِسْمَارَ ذَهَبْ I saw in the handle around that area of the sword of uh, this companion, uh, Sahal Ibn Hunayf, uh, a nail, something of that sort, made from gold. So gold used in swords is permissible. Another exception to the use of gold, and that wherein a necessity dictates or necessitates that you have to use gold. For example, uh, having a nose made of gold and other necessities similar to that. Where this is taken from is the hadith collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, the hadith of Arab Jafar ibn Sa'ad, I've heard it also as Ibn As'ad. Allah knows which one is correct. Arjafa ibn Sa'ad, that his uh, nose was cut in the Battle of Kulab. So he took a nose from silver. But then it became, um, it deteriorated upon him. That's the word I'm looking for. Corroded or something of that nature upon him. So the Prophet ﷺ commanded him to take a nose in its place made from gold. Okay, so this shows you that in the case of necessity, you can use gold. What is the qa'id al-mashhura? What is the famous qa'id that we've taken many times used to prove that in terms of necessity, that which is haram, you can use in terms of necessity? Question to yourselves, what is the famous qa'id, the famous rule that we have taken many a time to prove that in terms of necessity, you can use something which is in its foundation forbidden. So the qaida, as you know, as we've taken many times, as that the necessities permit that which is unlawful, okay? Necessity permits that which is unlawful, but of course this has to be taken with another qaida, which is uh, 
that the necessity is given estimation in, in, in how much is needed from it. That you can't just openly go and take whatever you want from the haram, you take only that which is needed. The author he says, and it's permissible for the women to wear from gold and silver that which is a common custom for them in their norm, in their society, uh, to wear, even if it's a lot. Again, the word low to show that there's a valid difference of opinion here. So the author says it's permissible for the women to wear whatever they want from gold and silver, as, as long as that's found to be the norm uh, for their level of living in their society. There's no zakah in their jewelry, which is prepared for them to wear and to use, or for them to lend out to their friends, cousins, etc. There's no zakah on the jewelry. Why? Because we have the hadith from the Prophet Sallallahu excuse me, collected by Imam Ahmad and Abi Dawood, Jabir radiallahu anhu, the hadith is marfu'. He said, Laysa fil hulli zakatun. The Prophet said there is no, no zakat in the jewelry, meaning the jewelry of the women. Laysa fil hulli zakatun. There is no zakat in the jewelry for women. Except, the author, he mentions exception. Wa in u'idda lil kira. Okay, if it is prepared for kira, aw in nafaqati, aw in nafaqa, aw kana muharraman, fa fihi zakat. So in these three, three situations, there would be an exception. That zakah would be obligatory. What is the first of them? Ridda lil kira. Kira is that the the gold is going to be used to be rented out. Okay, it's going to be used to be rented out, and money is going to be made from that. In that situation, the gold there is zakah upon it. Okay. Aw nafqa. Nafqa is that you are using the person who owns the gold is using it uh, to pay for their daily needs okay to pay for the rent of their house for example so the sister the woman who owns that gold she uses portions of it portions of that jewelry to pay yearly or monthly for her rent so any nafaka then there's a care upon that amount of gold which is going to be used or the gold is muharram or the gold is haram so the woman she owns gold but it's haram for her how can the gold be haram for her that she owns what is an example of gold that can be haram for her which she owns where upon zakah would be uh, upon this gold. Anyone have an example? So the ulama they say, Fadl, somebody going to answer? Um, gold that is not considered jewelry. So if the gold is not considered jewelry, then it won't fit into our discussion here. Then zakah is going to be upon it. But I'm saying that this gold, it is considered jewelry. It's definitely jewelry. But the zakah is going to be paid upon it because it's haram. But how can this be? What, give me a situation, a scenario, where the gold jewelry can be haram for this sister. <clears throat> so in any case, the ulama, they say an example of this is that the gold is made in a statue form, the statue of a living being. So if it's made in the form of a statue of a living being, for whatever strange reason, then zakah is going to be obligatory upon it because it is muharram. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. So these are the points that we needed to mention today. Which is Allah khair, ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to reward us immensely for this small effort and to give us a correct understanding of this fiqh and to make us from those who act upon the best of what we hear, anything which was correct which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mistakes and shortcomings from myself and Shaytan. If you have any questions upon the text, the mutton that we took in the explanation, then feel free. <clears throat>